I'm extremely um, honored to be here and talk to you, and I hope I don't drive you crazy. Uh, I, I feel better. I spend a lot of time working on my prose and so on, and I feel better if I can just read in a conversational way the paper rather than try to summarize it and then have to backtrack and say, oh, I forgot to say this. So anyway, here we go. We who call ourselves philosophers can benefit by occasionally stepping back from the fray and, re and reflecting on how we came to be the philosophers we came to be. This is not simply a matter of self-serving autobiographical curiosity. Done rightly, it can shed character, shed light on the character of what we take for granted. In particular, what we take for granted in pursuing issues that arise precisely because we take for granted what we do. A philosopher, observed C.A. Strong, is commonly thought of as a reasoner, but I would rather conceive him as a person careful in his assumptions. That's C.A. Strong. Um, and I think that's on the handout. I think the quotations I have should be on the handout. Um, this thought came to me recently in the course of serving as an external reader of a PhD thesis. The details are not important, but other, among other topics, the thesis addressed the question whether panpsychism provides a sensible way of bridging the explanatory gap. For anyone unfamiliar with the expression, the explanatory gap is the label philosophers use for the epistemological gulf separating the hard-edged character of the material cosmos and the gauzy character of conscious experiences. In reflecting on the line taken in the thesis, I underwent a kind of philosophical epiphany. For better or worse, I've learned to trust or at least respect gut feelings when it comes to metaphysics. Charlie Martin liked to say that metaphysics was done down here pointing to his substantial belly and not up here, pointing to his head, which housed a substantial brain. In the same vein, Charlie observed that you did not really understand a position until you could live it. By this, he did not mean that you had to accept a position to understand it, but you had to feel its visceral pull. A position that exerted no such pull would lack credibility. In my own case, I found that the best way to understand what I really think about a topic that evokes a strong reaction in me is to sit down and explain it to myself. Sometimes this results in my concluding that my reaction was justified. More often, it leads me to see that my reaction was either uncharitable or simply off base. Jonathan Schaffer begins a recent paper with an off-quoted passage from Leibniz, and this should be on the handout. Everyone must admit that perception and everything that depends on it is inexplicable by mechanical principles, by shapes and motions, that is. Imagine there were a machine which by its structure produced thought, feeling, and perception. We can imagine it as being enlarged while maintaining the same relative proportions to the point where we could go inside it as we would go into a mill. But if that were so, when we went in, we would find nothing but pieces which push, push against one another and never anything to account for a perception. Now, Schaffer, like many others, reckons that the passage amounts to an 18th century acknowledgement of the epistemological chasm between the characteristics of material bodies and the characteristics of conscious experiences, phenomenal qualities, um, qualia, that sort of thing. In this, Schaeffer is certainly not alone. Leibniz has taken to epitomize the kind of unshakable dualist convictions that give rise to what David Chalmers calls the hard problem, the problem of finding a place for conscious experiences within the material cosmos. Colin again exemplifies this attitude when he asks rhetorically, and this too is on the handout, I believe, um, how can technicolor phenomenology arise from soggy gray matter. Just, just reflect on that, the, the meaning of those words, right? Technicolor phenomenology, okay? He's just bought the farm. The, this reading of, of the quoted passage is, I believe, of the Leibniz passage I quoted, I, is, I believe, mistaken. But I shall postpone discussion of Leibniz and focus first on the explanatory gap 
and its deployment by philosophers in the service of various metaphysical projects. The explanatory gap was so named by Joseph Levine in the course of examining the relation conscious minds bear to material bodies. This is a paper he published in 1983. And I have a couple of quotations from Levine on the um, from Levine on the handout. Levine set out to transform an influential metaphysical argument advanced by Saul Kripke against mind-body identity into an epistemological argument. Kripke held that if A and B are identical, if A is B, A and B could not have failed to be identical. A could not have failed to be B. In the idiom of possible worlds, if A is B, then there is no possible world at which A fails to be B. <laughs> B, B. Channeling Descartes, Kripke argues that we have no trouble conceiving minds without bodies. So we have every reason to suppose that there are worlds at which minds are not embodied. Hence, the identification of minds with bodies fails or mental properties with material properties, whatever. Levine doubts that the Cartesian intuition that minds could exist apart from bodies supports Kripke's conclusion. What it does support, however, is, and this is a quotation, a closely related epistemological thesis, namely that psychophysical identity statements have a, leave a significant explanatory gap and as a corollary that we don't have any way of determining exactly which psychophysical identity statements are true. Many of you will be familiar with what comes next, so I shall be brief. Suppose you thought that pains were going on in the brain, C-fiber firings, right? This is at best a contingent truth. Functionalists had established the satisfaction of many that type identity, identities were not on the cards. Creatures with very different physiologies could plausibly experience pain. Pain is multiply realizable. To be in pain is to be in a state that plays the pain role, a, pa a state brought about by heat, pressure, and tissue damage, for instance, that produces aversive thoughts and behavior. The material nature of such states could vary across species. This leaves open the possibility of token identities, however. An individual creature's pains might be identifiable with whatever state plays the pain role in that creature. This, in fact, was the position endorsed by David Armstrong and David Lewis. Suppose then that you had evidence that in a particular case, an occurrence of C fibers played the pain role. Would this support the identification of this instance of pain with an instance of C fiber firing? Levine compares this case with one discussed by Kripke, the identification of heat with molecular motion. The felt contingency of the connection between heat and molecular motion can be explained away, presumably by detailed inspection of heated bodies. And you see moving moving particles. Nothing of this kind is available in the mind-body case. Neither closer inspection of the brain of someone undergoing a conscious experience, nor careful introspection by the one jet undergoing the experience would illuminate or explain how conscious experiences could be identified with brain states. Levine's argument, together with arguments by Frank Jackson and others, underlie the widespread belief that conscious experiences are sui generis. Most philosophers and scientists accept that consciousness depends in some fashion on an appropriate material substrate, although there is disagreement over whether this dependence is contingent. According to some, where the laws of nature differ, a particle for particle duplicate of a fully conscious agent <coughs> might fail to be conscious. And people associate, people talk about zombies and associate this with um, Kirk's paper published in 1974. In fact, Keith Campbell used this example in a, in a little book on, in Philosophy of Mind that he published in 1970. So Campbell is one of the most underappreciated philosophers uh, alive, I think. 
if not the most underappreciated. Uh, and don't get me going on the, mo the two much appreciated philosophers, the philosophers that are appreciated but deserve not to be. So anyway, so uh, particle for part the zombie uh, possibility. Others, panpsychists, argue that consciousness must be in on the ground floor. A conscious agent could not be destruct constructed using only non-conscious components. All parties agree that the explanatory gap between characteristics of purely material systems and characteristics of conscious experiences is momentous. The dialectic here is instructive. It begins with a metaphysical argument against the identification of conscious states and material states. This is transformed into a, an epistemological argument focused on explanation. Levine sees this as a friendly move in support of the conviction that the relation between the mental and the physical is opaque. Conscious mental states appear to be add-ons, additions to whatever material states might be thought to be responsible for them. This line of reasoning in both its metaphysical and epistemological guises is recognized by its av advocates as falling short of conclusiveness. The aim rather is to establish that anyone who professes to identify the mental and the physical bears a non-trivial burden of proof. How could conscious experiences possibly be material states and processes? How would that work? In the case of heat and molecular motion, there's a story to tell, but no comparable story is available in the mental material case. The difficulty differs from the kinds of difficulty. So I'm trying to get you to feel grabbed by this thesis, okay? I, I'm, I'm, we're, I'm trying to live this thesis, all right? The difficulty differs from the kinds of difficulty scientists encounter every day in endeavoring to come to grips with the cosmos. It's rarely obvious how things work as they do and why they are as they are. It can take years to reach even a tentative understanding of a particular material system, state, or process. In the case of consciousness, however, the difficulty is not simply one of detail, one we could expect to solve by doing more and finer grained lab laboratory work. Quantum physics currently lacks a single agreed upon interpretation, but there is no lack of candidates. When it comes to conscious experience and their relation to material states and processes, in contrast, the situation is, if not hopeless, desperate. It is hard to know where to begin. Panpsychism enjoys a prima facie advantage here. You can see how ordinary particles or ordinary objects could have mass. They're made up of particles that have mass. Similarly, if the particles were conscious, it's no mystery that some of the things they make up are conscious. Consciousness could be a property of a complex because its parts are conscious. If complex creatures are conscious, their parts, ultimately the quarks and leptons, must have it in them to give rise to such creatures. The quarks and leptons must have at least flickers of consciousness. Some panpsychists, like my Durham colleague, Philip Goff, worry that even if conscious experiences go all the way down the quarks and lep to the quarks and leptons, the explanatory gap resurfaces in the form of a grain problem. How do you get from tiny bits of consciousness to the kinds of unified conscious experiences found in sentient creatures? Whether or not this difficulty is serious, it's worth recalling the original motivation for panpsychism. You start with a puzzle of how something capable of qualitatively rich conscious experiences could be made up of parts wholly lacking in such qualities. One way to account for complex entities having a particular characteristic, C, is to accept that its parts or some of, its, or some of them are also C. <clears throat> Although this is true in the case of mass, it is certainly not true in the case of many unremarkable characteristics of complex objects. Their colors, for instance. Why imagine that conscious qual qualities are like mass and not like colors? A beetroot is red, roughly spherical, and pungent, 
despite none of its particles making it up being red, spherical, or pungent. Two common reactions to examples of this kind are worth, worth mentioning. Consider the beetroot's color. First, it is sometimes claimed that the beetroot's redness is not in the beetroot, which after all is made up of colorless, colorless particles, but in the minds of perceivers. Philosophers speak of phenomenal redness, right? Phenomenal redness, and they nobody calls them on it. Now, nobody takes that as an actually a substance, a, a, a gigantic substance, substantive thesis built into that label. Philosophers speak of phenomenal redness, distinguishing this from characteristics of objects thought to produce color experiences in suitably equipped perceivers. If experiences but not beat roots can be read, however, this would seem to require the particles conscious qualities to be colored. <laughs> How else could they give rise to colored experiences? If, however, you accept that color experiences could, it, could result from assemblages of non-colored components, then why resist the thoughts that con conscious qualities generally could result from essential assemblages of non-conscious -con particles? Sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. A second, perhaps more common and down to earth response, is that this is a problem only because philosophers make it one. What is a philosophical problem that we don't, that is a problem just because we make it one? We know after all, that when you arrange insensible particles in the right way, you get something red. We know this not because we have derived truths about colored objects from truths pertaining exclusively to colored particles and their characteristics, or because we can see how you could get something colored from colorless somethings. We know it because we know that if you take a red beet, beetroot apart, eventually you arrive at colorless particles. That is the way the particles work. Their working this way stems from their natures, not from their obeying add-on laws of nature underlying the production of colors. Among other characteristics, the particles have it in them to combine in ways that result in colored objects. There is an explanatory, an epistemological gap between the cosmos as des described by physics and the cosmos we encounter as we go about our lives. This gap has nothing to do with the special character of conscious experiences. It stems from our deployment of incommensurable modes of description and explanation in physics and in biology, psychology, and the various special sciences and in everyday life. The incommensurably, in incommensurability of what Wilfred Sellers called the manifest and scientific images is an, in the, is an incommensurability in conception, not in reality. This is how philosophers as different as Spinoza and Donald Davidson has seen it when it comes to the mental and the material. According to Davidson, the mental material distinction is a distinction in conception only. What scholastic and early modern philosophers, including Spinoza uh, and Descartes for that matter, would have called a distinction of reasoned reason, not a real, distinct, a real distinction. If A and B are really distinct, either could exist in the absence of other. This is what Descartes and by extension Kripke had in mind in declaring that there was a real distinction between, extend, between thinking and extended substances. Davidson, in contrast, holds that although mental and physical predicates differ in their application conditions, any event that could be truly referred to in a mental idiom answered as well to a physical description. David, Davidson understands this as a substantive thesis the plausibility of which stems from its providing a way to see how reasons could be causes of actions. Causation, Davidson thinks, is a relation among events that fall under strict exceptionalist, exceptionalist laws. Only physical events satisfy this requirement. There are no mental physical or mental mental exceptionalist laws. Thus, mental events could figure in causal relations only if they were physical, only if they answered to physical descriptions. Laws concern events 
under physical descriptions. The mental realm is anomalous, anomalous monism, right? Uh, there is no systematic mapping between mental and physical categories, hence no prospect of strict laws capturing relations among events described in a mental vocabulary. Functionalists are happy to accept the anomalousness of the mental. What functionalists would not accept is the fur further thought that events are mental or physical, as Davidson puts it, only as described. Davidson has had his share of critics, but I cannot recall anyone's invoking the explanatory gap and disputing his position. There is a gap. In fact, Davidson insists upon it. This was not regarded as a barrier to the identification of the mental and the physical, however, only a reflection of a lack of alignment between our mental and physical conceptual repertoires. Some of you will be unmoved, probably all of you. You're all probably tapping your feet or tapping your pencil on the table. Some of you will be unmoved. Davidson's target was the propositional attitudes, beliefs, desires, and intentions. There's no special barrier to seeing how these could be identified with physical states of agents. The problem arises because, uh, because experiential phenomenal states, qualia, exhibited quali exhibit qualities not to be found in the material realm. Such responses are disingenuous. The explanatory gap arises because there seems no prospect of explaining consciousness in purely physical terms. Can you, how, can you see how a given physical state, given an exhaustive description in a vocabulary drawn from physics, could constitute a belief or any other propositional attitude? For that matter, it is, is it obvious how something with all the familiar qualities of water results from combining hydrogen and oxygen atoms. These notable epistemological and semantic facts lack metaphysical import <clears throat> and bring with them no momentous shifts in the burden of proof. Okay, I want to talk uh, a, a little bit now about the knowledge argument, Frank Jackson. One way to appreciate what is at issue here is to reflect on Frank Jackson's influential, influential thought experiment in which Mary, a brilliant scientist, and this is a quotation on your handout, is for whatever reason forced to investigate the world from a black and white room via a black and white television monitor. She specializes in the neurophysiology of vision and acquires, let us suppose, all the physical information there is to obtain about what goes on when we see ripe tomatoes or the sky and use terms like red, blue, and so on. Okay, end of quotation. Eventually, Mary escapes her black and white environment. Will she, Jackson asks, learn something new about color, the focus of her research? The answer is obvious. Of course she will. She'll learn what it's like to experience colors. Thank you, Tom Nagel. This is not something Mary could extract from the physics and neurophysiology of color and color experiences. Given that, as Jackson put it, Mary knows all the pertinent physical facts prior to leaving the room, facts about what it is like to experience colors um, must be non-physical. You know, when I read this argument, I just think this is a joke, but okay, let's, I'll keep going. I don't want to, I don't want to make you hate me yet. Mary's very vast knowledge of the nature of colors and color vision assuredly leaves her in the dark of what it would be like to undergo a color experience. This is not some, this is not something to deducible from physical facts. So the qualitative color uh, uh, character of color experiences, if the uh, if not the experiences themselves, must be non-physical. Again, we're offered a plainly epistemological argument and invited to draw a metaphysical conclusion. Imagine a different Mary, a Mary who knows everything there is to know about the physics of beet roots, but has never encountered a beet root. This Mary would undoubtedly be surprised to learn what beet roots are like on first encountering one. 
the prospects of deducing the character of a beetroot from a detailed description drawn from physics are va vanishingly, vanishingly small, but there's no temptation to regard beetroots as non-physical or to imagine that there's something dependent on, but distinct from the particles in uh, arranged in just the right way. Why, if beetroots are unexceptionable, are conscious experiences regarded as deeply fraught? You might worry and probably, probably are that this has all gone too quickly. Why well, doubt that Mary would be unable to, the second Mary would be unable to work out what beetroots are like in advance of encountering one. After all, Mary knows enough about the physics of things that are a lot like beetroots in various ways, cricket balls, red cabbages, peppers, and onions, for instance. It would not be unreasonable to suppose that she could infer from her knowledge of similarities in the physics of these things and the physics of beetroots, what beetroots might be like. Maybe so, but the worry is misplaced. If Mary can work out what beetroots are like, she does so not from the physics alone, but only with the aid of her knowledge of what all those other beetroot stand-ins stand are like. <clears throat> the physics gives her the relevant similarities, perhaps, but the physics is silent on what beetroots are like. Mary's working that out is not a discursive process, but one that relies on imagery and previous experiences. So again, why, if beetroots are unexceptionable, are conscious experiences regarded as in, intensely mysterious? Part of the answer to this question lies in understanding what its likeness. Could you extract what it is like to ride a bicycle or stand on your head from detailed physical descriptions of these activities, the kind you would get in physics, right? Knowing what it is like to ride a bicycle, stand on your head, or experience colors is not a matter of coming into possession of a description, physical or non-physical, of these endeavors. It's a matter of doing or undergoing them. Nothing of metaphysical import follows from the presence of a gap between descriptions of a state and knowing what it is like to be in that state. I leave it to you to work out how you might extrapolate from your knowledge of what it is like to engage in similar activities to a sense of what it would be like to ride a bicycle or stand on your head or something comparable. Even if all this is right, we're still faced with the nagging difficulty of understanding how experiencing red or undergoing a painful sensation could possibly be identified with a physical state. Were you to inspect my brain when I am in pain or looking at a beetroot, you would detect nothing remotely like my experience. It is not just that you could not work out the character of my experiences from a careful examination of my brain. That is the explanatory gap. And while it might be epistemological in character, its presence, it might be thought, has an, a metaphysical explanation. We cannot extract the nature of experiences from descriptions of physical states because it is unfathomable how those states could possibly be experiences. Okay, now ask yourself what it would be like to observe, to experience after all, another's experience. Suppose Mary is visually apprehending a red beetroot in bright sunlight. Mary, Mary is experiencing red. Suppose in addition that whenever Mary, along with other ordinary human observ observers, experiences something red, her brain goes into a state R. You, are, you armed with a state of the art scanning electron cerebroscope are observing R. Cerebroscopes were invented by Herbert Feigl a long time ago. Um, you are happy to say, so you're observing R, that what we're saying is goes on in Mary when she's experiencing red, uh, you are happy to say that R is correlated with Mary's experiencing red, but how could Mary's being in R, being in that physical state, possibly be her experiencing red? Mary's experiencing uh, experience of red is nothing at all like R. Well, what would you expect an experience of red to look like? Would you expect it to be red? Would you expect Mary's visual experience of a beetroot to be something like a tiny picture of a beetroot in Mary's brain? 
If you discovered such a picture, would it, the picture, be a candidate uh, be a candidate experience? Mary or anyone else's visual experience of a beetroot is not itself like a picture of a beetroot. The beetroot, not Mary's experience, is red. The fact that an an experience lacks the character of what is being experienced should be unsurprising. The fact that R, that's the brain state, differs qualitatively from the object of Mary's experience, R is neither red nor roughly spherical, is itself no barrier to the identification of R with her experience. All in place, UT place call the mistake of conflating qualities of what is experienced and qualities of the experience, we call that the phenomenological fallacy. The temptation to do this, the temptation to conflate experienced qualities and qualities of experiences is abetted by the kinds of epistemological consideration in play in invocations of the explanatory gap. Something's being in a state is one thing, Observing a state is, uh, 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 sorry, observing a state something is in is something else altogether. This, together with the fact that you cannot deduce what it would be like to be in a state from, a de- from detailed philo- uh, physical descriptions of the state, can conspire to produce Levine's feeling of contingency and the sense that conscious experiences could not be identified with physical states. Identity is neither reduction or elimination. Think about identity. To describe the mind-brain identity theory as a form of materialism ignores the symmetrical nature of identity. Charlie Martin, at one time a colleague of both Place and JJC Smart when they were all three in Adelaide, Uh, and who were early proponents of the identity theory, like to cite a cartoon. Charlie loved to cite this cartoon in which two people are conversing. The first says this, when two people are married, they become one. The second, mulling this over, asks, which one? (laughs) Look, if water is H2O, H2O is water, okay? Identifying water with H2O is not to reduce or eliminate water. It is to spell out the uh, nature, uh, spell out what water is. If experiences are brain states, some brain states are experiences. None of this supports panpsychism or for that matter, idealism. Panpsychism errs by starting with the thought that mental qualities are sui generis then locates them at the root level. Why go along? What exactly are the qualities of experiences? What are the qualities of your visual experience of a beetroot? Okay, the the qualities of your experience, not those of the beetroot. Don't don't talk about redness, that's in the beetroot. Do these differ from the qualities of your visual experience of an avocado? And if they do, do they differ in ways that resist the identification of the experiences with occurrences in your brain. Invocations of what its likeness are beside the point. If the mental physical distinction is one of conception only, a distinction of reasoned reason, remember that was a dis- distinction of reasoned reason, um, panpsychism is beside the point just as pan materialism would be. A distinction of reason and reason is what philosophers nowadays would call a conceptual distinction. It was, it's actually s- subtly different and more interesting, but that's, that gets you the sense. Okay, so I'm gonna n- now say a few words uh, before shutting up about um, Jonathan Schaffer. Um, I began by uh, deploying a quotation brandished by Jonathan, and that was the quotation from Leibniz. Uh, I, I, began by uh, brandishing this, by deploying this quotation that's brandished by Jonathan Schaffer in a paper that addresses some of the topics I've been discussing. Schaffer argues that explanatory gaps are in fact everywhere, even in cases, the identification of heat and molecular motion, for instance, 
invoked uh, by philosophers who consider the gap between the mental and the material special. I agree with Schaffer's assessment, but not with his reasons for thinking that this is so, nor with his proposals for uh, gap bridging. Okay. Um, if I am right, explanatory gaps are epistemological and semantic. Schaffer regards them as metaphysical. Apparent gaps arise when you lack the appropriate substantive metaphysical bridge principles. We need substantive metaphysical bridge principles. These, he thinks, include a grounding relation. When I hear the word grounding, I just want to go, la, 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 la. <clears throat> and this, he, he says this about the grounding relation. It's a relation of directed dependency among entities, answering to the idea that there's not just a distinction between the more and less fundamental, but moreover, a connection from the more to the less fundamental. Grounding names this connection. And this is on the handout. Schaffer argues that if explanatory gaps between fundamental phenomena and less fundamental phenomena are characterized solely by reference to conceptual, logical, or a priori opacity, they're metaphysically otios. Moving from the fundamental things to the rest, he argues, calls for expressly metaphysical principles that connect what is fundamental to, a less fun to the less fundamental in a systematic fashion. And this is what he says. This is a quote, another quotation from him. Explanatory gaps are everywhere in nature, lurking in every concrete transition from more to less fundamental, to be bridged only by the addition of substantive metaphysical grounding principles. Grounding principles are needed to determine whether there are derivative concrete entities at all and to, to determine what they are like. <laughs> End of quotation. The pertinent grounding connections are analogous to causal connections in being directed dependency connections. Causal connections bridge the gap between causes and effects. Grounding connections bridge gaps between the more and less fundamental. To get from hydrogen and oxygen atoms to water molecules, you need a principle that connects the atoms duly related to a less fundamental something, a molecule. These principles are metaphysically substantive. They're not empirical principles, they're metaphysical principles. They compete in the metaphysical arena with say nihilism, the view that they're all there is are the fundamental things. There are no molecules or beat roots, only the particles. Such principles are not provable or excludable a priori, the metaphysical bridge principles, uh, nor are they extractable from physics. Physics needs our help, philosophers. Their credibility rests on their having a role in what and, um, in the most parsimonious system, as Schaffer puts it, the simplest and strongest overall system. This is not the place to take up grounding. In my view, the perceived need for grounding principles stems from conflating epistemology and metaphysics in a manner that reflects badly on both. The idea that science requires supplementing by metaphysics to accommodate identities across a conceptual divide evinces a kind of philosophical hubris best left in the seminar room. <clears throat> the scientific image, what you have in physics, is orthogonal to the manifest image. This is not something that calls for a grounding rate relation, a directed dependency relation between a, a fundamental level of being and one more or less than fundamental reality. The manifest in scientific images are images of the self-same cosmos, each associated with incommensurable projects, vocabularies, and modes of explanation. This is a point well appreciated by Leibniz. And now I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Uh, I need to say a few words uh, about Leibniz, um, especially because Martin is listening, or at least his picture's on the screen. Earlier, I promised to say something about the excerpt from Leibniz's monad monadology. <laughs> Um, that led off the discussion. 
My suggestion at the time was that it is a mistake to read Leibniz as adverting to an explanatory gap between conscious experiences or minds and the material cosmos. I am not a historian, but even a moderately attentive reader can see that this is no part of Leibniz's projects. Three paragraphs before the quoted par passage, Leibniz says the following. The transitory state, which incorporates a, a multitude within a unity or within a simple substance, is nothing but what we call perception. So, ooh, um, raw feels, but no, which must be carefully distinct, distinguished from apperception or consciousness, as will become clear in what follows. Okay. <laughs> One model for the behavior of Leibniz's monads might be the behavior of particles in entangled states. The particles behave as they do, as behave as though they understood and anticipated the behavior of fellow particles, but they do so without interacting causally. The state of a particle over here reflects the state of a particle over there, although the particles are not in communication with one another. A monad's perceptions or states that correspond to the states of fellow monads as they evolve over time. And uh, another quotation from Leibniz, now this interconnection or this adapting, and this is teleological, of all created things to each one and of each one to all the others means that each simple substance has relationships which express all the others and that it, there is, that it is therefore a perpetual living mirror of the universe. Some monads are capable of degrees of apperception, awareness of their own states. And uh, continuing the quotation, all things conspire, and this is Leibniz, all things conspire, as Hippocrates said, uh, but a soul can only read within itself what is represented in it distinctly. It could never develop all at once everything that it unfolds because it goes on to infinity. That's the end of the quotation. Given that the state of every monad re reflects, the states of every monad reflect the states of every other monad, apperception can amount to what would ordinarily be called perception, both inward and outward. The evolution of a monad's internal states could not be a mechanical process. Mechanisms have interacting parts and monads are partless symbols. On such a conception, space is not a container not a stage on which monads play out their careers. Space is an abstraction from the collective states of monads, their individual perspectives. Truths about spatial relations are made true by non-relational features of monads. Given that each monad mirrors every other monad, there's no place for indiscernible monads. If A and B are per are, have precisely the same perspective, A is B the identity of indiscernibles, which is often regarded as highly implausible. You might regard a cosmology, and I don't think Leibniz um, accepted universals, but he, so it's not just, we're not just talking about universals here. You might regard a cosmology of this sort as beneath consideration, a non-starter founded on a miraculous harmony among monads. But the New Newtonian postulation of forces among particles acting instantaneously and universally in accord with an inverse square law is hardly an improvement. Although I find it attractive in many ways, my, name, my aim is not to defend Leibniz's cosmology, but merely to point out that his observation about mechanistic explanations have nothing whatever to do with the latter day explanatory gap. Okay, just, I'm almost done. I acknowledge that nothing I have said here is original. This is how it is in philosophy. The same points must be made and remade as audiences evolve. What is opaque at one time can be transparent at another time and the other way around. What makes sense at one time may require substantial revision before it makes sense at another time. At present, we are captive to assumptions that make conscious experiences outliers, crying out for heavy duty metaphysical maneuvers. Materialism and panpsychism are just two of the most prominent examples. As Wallace Matson and Peter King observe, the mind-body pro problem has not always been seen as a problem. 
Were Davidson and Spinoza right? Were the mental material distinction a distinction of conception only, a distinction of reason to reason? Dualism, materialism, and panpsychism would all be beside the point. Materialism begins with the thought that the mental material distinction is a real distinction. The mental is non-material and rejects the mental. That's materialism. So we accept the dichotomy and reject the middle. Identifying the, middle, the mental with the material, however, is not to eliminate the mental. If A is B, B is A. Panpsychism tacitly affirms the mental material distinction before concluding that mental qualities <coughs> uh, pervade nature. Both are founded on the dubious assumption that mental qualities are metaphysically fraught and in consequence must be either everywhere or nowhere. That's it.